Hey everyone, this is Dr. Marcon, and we are going over part of chapter 16 on the human digestive system. So we talked previously about cellular respiration and the products of cellular respiration, specifically from glycolysis as well as the citric acid cycle, are these molecules of NADH. And we have so much NADH, what's a cell to do? Um, so from the from uh, the other processes, we have all these NADH, and we go to the electrotransport chain. So let's go to the electron transport chain and make ATP. Let's go cash in that gold, our gold nuggets of NADH with all those lovely electrons. So we've gotten to step three of cellular respiration, specifically aerobic cellular respiration occurring within the mitochondria. We've reached the electron transport chain. So this is a process that produces the bulk or the majority of ATP. We know that the mitochondrion is that organelle within the cell that produces our ATP. So uh, the bulk of our ATP, about 34 uh, molecules of ATP. Electrons are transported from, are transferred from NADH to electron carriers within the electron transport chain. Um, so think of, think of NADH as that full Uber car, um, which then once it goes through the electron transport chain is converted back into NAD plus, which is that empty Uber car because it has dumped its, its, ele its, uh, its electrons. So electron carriers use the electrons to pump hydrogen um, ions or protons, which will be used to power an enzyme called ATP synthase. And we know that ATP synthase is an enzyme which will convert uh, or bring together phosphate plus a molecule of ADP to form ATP. Okay. Um, we know that oxygen loves electrons, and oxygen is the final acceptor of the electrons, which will combine with our hydrogen um, to make water, H2O. And actually, there is a video, a YouTube video, that you can watch to review this process. So here we see NADH. Um, relieve, uh, releasing those hydrogen protons um, and electrons are then used to kind of power that enzyme um, to create ATP through the enzyme ATP synthase. The product of that is water. So again, just another review of the process. We see our NADH we see um, the electrons being transported from the NADH to the electron carriers within the electron transport chain um, and then being uh, transported and then uh, reduced to NAD. Uh, these electron carriers will use the electrons to prompt these protons, um, hydrogen protons, to power that ATP synthase enzyme to create ATP. And of course, that uh, final product uh, will be water. So here are our learning objectives for this chapter. We want to demonstrate an understanding of the relationship between the different levels of biological organization. So sort of a review of uh, the, the things that we covered in chapter one, the levels of uh, biological organization. We also want to explain the basic structure and functions of the human digestive system. So we should, once we cover the anatomy, we should be able to trace the, the path that food will take and describe what happens to it as it moves through the human digestive system. So how do we go from this, our food and our macromolecules, to a living, breathing organisms? Um, what are living things made of? How are structures built? So just a little review of the levels of biological organization on human terms. Um, we see that atoms make up molecules or compounds, which will make up organelles, which are structures within a cell. Cells that have a common purpose make up tissues. Tissues 
that also have a common purpose make up organs, a bunch of organs um, make up an organ system, which will then form an organism. So to kind of simplify it, imagine that you are just one cell in our virtual classroom. So if you close your eyes, you can imagine what's inside you, what is around you, are you by yourself? Now together, you and your fellow classmates or fellow cells will make up a tissue. Teachers or instructors, such as yours truly, uh, plus the students will make up an organ. Okay, And then teachers plus students plus uh, Los Medanos College Support Services make up an organ system. And then our teachers, students, LMC plus outside support make an organism. Okay, so just a review of that hierarchy or levels of biological organization that we went over in chapter one. So now we can move on to explain the basic structures and functions of the human digestive system. Within the body, we have our four major types of human tissues that are actually shown on this slide. So what tissues do humans have? We have our nervous tissue composed of our neurons. We can find this in our nervous system, our brain and spinal cord, as well as the nerves that make up the nervous system. We have our connective tissue and different types of connective tissue going from loose connective tissue to dense connective tissue, dense regular, dense irregular. We have our adipose tissue all making up uh, that uh, supportive type of tissue within our body. We have epithelial tissue. These are the tissues that line our body, that line our inner surfaces and our outer surfaces, our skin, our organs. Um, this is all epithelial tissue. And then, of course, we have our muscle tissue, and we have three types of muscle tissue. We have our skeletal muscle tissue that makes up the muscles of our skeletal system. Uh, and then we have our cardiac muscle tissue that uh, makes up the muscle of the walls of the heart. And we have our smooth muscle tissue, which aligns the hollow organs and uh, different structures within our body. So these are the four types of, uh, four major types of human tissues within our body. So we know that together, uh, if we think of that biological organization, uh, you and your fellow classmates make a tissue. Uh, and a tissue is a group of cells that work together to perform a common function. So what tissues make organs in the digestive system? Uh, of course, we have uh, the tissue that protects the underlying tissues. We have uh, supportive tissue where nerves can run through it. Uh, we have our um, layer of muscles that keep things moving along. So we have first our mucosal layer, also known as our endothelium, which is that epithelial tissue, more than likely made up of a simple columnar epithelial tissue. We have a supportive connective tissue in the submucosa, which is in the second layer, where we have nervous tissue or nerves that run through uh, that layer. And of course, we have a third layer called the muscularis, predominantly made up of smooth muscle. Again, smooth muscle tissue is that uh, type of muscle that helps things moving along within the digestive system. Okay. So big take home with regards to the tissues that make up the digestive system. Every organ in the digestive system is made up of these four basic tissues. Our nervous tissue, our connective tissue, epithelial tissue, and our uh, muscle tissue. So what does the digestive system do? What is its function? We know that the main function of the digestive system is basically to break stuff into smaller usable pieces. So take those large macromolecules that we see in our food that we talked about, such as our carbohydrates, our proteins, our lipids, um, and then break them down into the smaller mon monomers to be absorbed. So here we can see food moving into the esophagus, um, we see, can see some carbohydrates, maybe some proteins. We can see, you know, our, our enzymes uh, that will break down these molecules 
We also see, you know, acid within our stomach that helps break down this food. And then here, uh, it will then travel into the next part of the digestive system from our stomach into our small intestine, where we have secretions coming from our accessory organs, such as bile and enzymes, uh, so that um, our food can be broken down into even smaller uh, pieces or smaller monomers to be absorbed. Okay, so basically um, a lot of uh, digestion, breaking down uh, bigger molecules into smaller uh, molecules for absorption. So here actually we can see the main functions of the digestive system. So the digestive system actually does more than just break stuff down. We know that we ingest our food. So ingestion is the act of eating or feeding. Here we actually see um, these processes in a cat. So ingestion first is the act of eating or feeding. Digestion actually is the act of breaking down food. And we have um, chemical digestion as well as mechanical uh, digestion. Once these uh, large food molecules are broken down, we then have absorption. This is the uptake of the smaller mol monomers or nutrients by the cells. And then finally, we have elimination. This is the passage of undigested material, specifically within our feces. Okay, so we do have main st uh, the main stages of processing our food, which we can see in this slide. So ingestion, digestion, absorption, and finally elimination. So now that we've explained the basic structure and function of the human digestive system, then we can get into the fun part, the anatomy. We can then trace the food, the path the food takes, describes what happens to it as it moves through the human digestive system. So just an overview of the main structures within our digestive system. Of course, we have our mouth. Um, and then from our mouth, if we're, for example, eating a slice of pizza, um, we enter first the mouth. And then our pizza will go along this entire tube of the digestive tract. So the GI tract or digestive tract, gastrointestinal tract, however you'd like to call it, also called the alimentary canal, is actually a hollow tube. Um, which is about 30 feet long, and that's a very long tube. Uh, it's a complete gut with two openings from mouth to anus. So um, our pizza enters through the mouth uh, where it will be broken down by our teeth. Uh, we have other structures uh, that secrete into the mouth, um, uh, parts of the digestive system called the accessory organs, um, which also include the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. But for mo the most part, from the mouth, uh, food will enter the pharynx and from the pharynx into the esophagus, from the esophagus into the stomach, then into the small intestines, uh, then the large intestines uh, here at the cecum, going up the uh, ascending colon, then the uh, transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and then uh, into the rectum, and then what isn't digested will go out the anus. Okay, and then we also have uh, different parts of the small intestine, which we'll talk about. And again, the ex so those are the main organs of the digestive system. And then we have our accessory organs, which will basically secrete things into that main tube to help with uh, breaking down of that food so that those uh, monomers of our large macromolecules can be absorbed. So here we see a jealous little uh, organism. Uh, this looks like a nematode. So lucky for you, you have a complete gut, whereas uh, simple organisms such as nematodes do not. So now our pizza is ingested. We take in our food. What's happening in the mouth? Basically what happens is our mechanical digestion. And this is... Uh, aided by our teeth. So we are physically breaking down the food by chewing uh, our teeth. Um, as you can see, we have uh, 
the teeth, which are actually considered accessory organs of the digestive system. And then from the mouth or the oral cavity, we enter a uh, part of the tube called the pharynx. And when we talk about the respiratory system, we'll talk about the different parts of the pharynx. We have the uh, nasopharynx, which is kind of posterior to the nasal cavity. We have the oropharynx, which is posterior to the oral cavity. And then we have the laryngopharynx, which is actually posterior to the larynx. Um, but luckily, uh, when we talk about uh, the respiratory system, we have that structure called the epiglottis, which is a flap of cartilage that will close when we swallow so that food does not go into our trachea or our windpipe. Um, instead, it will go into this structure that's more posterior to the larynx, which is our esophagus. Okay, so within the mouth, um, we know that the mouth is the first defense against bacteria. We have immune structures, such as tonsils, that produce immune system cells to fight off any bacteria um, or foreign objects that might do our body harm. Okay, so what else happens in the mouth? What is pizza made of besides deliciousness? Um, if you prefer pepperoni, for me, I prefer sausage, um, goat cheese, and mushrooms, as well as hot sauce. But we know that you know, our meats on our, our pizza, if we enjoy meat, uh, can include proteins uh, and fats. Uh, the crust of this pizza includes our starches or our complex carbohydrates. Our cheese, of course, made up of fats and sugars. And then the tomato sauce includes sugars as well as more starches. So the pizza is bathed in saliva, and this saliva actually aids in chemical digestion. So the teeth aid in mechanical digestion, saliva aids in chemical digestion because we have um, secretions from our, from our glands. Um, our, our different digestive glands, such as the parotid gland, the submandibular gland, as well as the sublingual gland. So here we can see this large gland kind of anterior to our ear. Uh, we have a submandibular gland below the mandible and the sublingual gland below the tongue. These glands actually secrete enzymes uh, that uh, form saliva. So these enzymes, including amylase, will help break down the starches in our food. So uh, chemical digestion as well as mechanical digestion will actually produce what's known as a bolus, which is chewed food mixed with saliva. So as you can see, this person is uh, showing us his lovely bolus of food that uh, is being broken down by both his teeth as well as saliva. So from our mouth, the pizza was then pushed through the pharynx to the esophagus. So the pharynx uh, basically making up the structures within our throat. Um, and then this esophagus is a long muscular tube that connects to the stomach. It's about, mm, about 10 inches long. Um, so we can see that um, it will be then transported to this next organ of the digestive system, which is the stomach. So what helps us move our food along? We have uh, what's known as peristalsis. Peristalsis is the action that helps to move food through the digestive tract. And it's due to the muscles that line the GI tract are smooth muscles that create waves of muscle contractions that will propel food forward. So we can see that the muscles, um, the smooth muscles in the esophagus cause peristalsis, which allows food to be moved along. Okay, so then we reach structures, muscular structures called sphincters. And sphincters um, are actually thick muscular rings that help separate organs. Um, sphincters are important to prevent backflow. So here we have that gastroesophageal sphincter, um, or also known as the lower esophageal sphincter, which is that ring of smooth muscle that um, allow for passage of food but prevent the backflow of uh, the stomach contents back into the esophagus. So this sphincter will regulate release of food into the stomach and small intestine as well as control the release of waste. 
Now we have a condition known as gastroesophageal reflex uh, disease or GERD. This is when we have actually a loosening of this lower esophageal sphincter so that we have a reflux or a backflow of stomach contents. And we know that the stomach contents are actually acidic. So this um, gastroesophageal reflux disease produces symptoms of heartburn when we get that sort of um, burning sensation within our chest due to reflux disease. Uh, this can occur if you, uh, for example, drink wine, eat chocolate, have a lot of caffeine through coffee. Uh, smokers, and people who smoke cigarettes, often get uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And it's also recommended, especially in pregnancy, not to eat um, less than two to three hours before you go to bed. So. If you have a meal, uh, you know, make sure it's at least two to three hours before uh, lying down and sleeping. So, you know, that post uh, dinner nap is often not recommended. Um, I know for myself, I, I try to make sure, you know, I, I eat hours before I go to bed because I know um, I've had really bad reflux and it's caused a lot of um, painful uh, reflux symptoms as well as, you know, sometimes vomiting. So the esophagus pushes pizza to the stomach uh, through that lower esophageal sphincter. Um, and here we can see that within the stomach um, are, are these folds called gastric rugae. So the gastric rugae um, actually produce extra mucus because the environment within the stomach is acidic and we want mucus to kind of protect the lining the lining of the stomach uh, from that ex acidic environment so from the esophagus here we have the stomach and we have the different muscular layers within the stomach that help churn the food um, and provide a, a large surface area for um, in order to break down the food. So what's happening in the stomach? Remember that extra layer of, of muscle? So we have both, again, mechanical digestion as well as chemical digestion of our food. Uh, we have gastric juice that's made up of hydrochloric acid as well as enzymes such as pepsin that will break down proteins. And again, we have mucosal cells that will help protect the lining of the stomach. Um, if we have any damage to that lining, uh, we have what's known as gastric ulcers. Um, sometimes that can occur uh, when we have infection with the bacteria uh, Helicobacter pylori or H. pylori. This causes um, a breakdown of the mucosal cell lining of the stomach and causes ulcers or ulcerations. So the stomach with its muscular layers will churn the pizza, um, again, breaking down those major components of our food. Uh, once the stomach has finished breaking down uh, the components of our food, um, what's known as chyme will then be passed on to the small intestine. So just uh, a slide kind of describing an ulcer. So if you've ever had an ulcer, this occurs if uh, the mucus layer or layer one becomes damaged. Again, this could be due to um, hyperacidity of the stomach or um, more than likely the majority of the time, ulcers are due to infection with the bacteria H. pylori or Helicobacter pylori. Um, the exposed tissue underneath is now vulnerable to damage by the stomach, and we can see that stomach kind of causing uh, this damage known as ulcers, okay, so ulcerations, and it's very painful. So once the stomach has finished and done its job, uh, the substance known as chyme is then passed on to the small intestine. So we can see the stomach made this, it made chyme. So the small intestine will complete digestion and performs absorption. So the majority of absorption does occur in the small intestine. The small intestine can be divided into different parts. Uh, the first part is known as the duodenum or the duodenum. Um, the second part is called the uh, duodenum, And then the third part is called the ileum.
So that first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, um, is where digestion is completed, and then we have absorption. Now, we have different structures that will secrete into that first part, into the duodenum. Um, we have, for example, the gallbladder. The gallbladder is actually uh, important for the storage of bile from the liver. Um, the liver is actually located superior to uh, the gallbladder as well as the pancreas. So the liver uh, creates bile, whereas the gallbladder will store the bile. Um, and we'll later find out bile is actually important for the breakdown of our triglycerides or our lipids. So we can see the uh, common hepatic uh, duct. So the duct coming from the liver. Um, and then we have the cystic duct coming from the gallbladder. Uh, which forms the common bile duct, okay? So this common bile duct will then meet up with the main pancreatic duct uh, to then go through that um, hepatopancreatic ampulla into the duodenum. So the pancreas um, is very important because it produces many enzymes. It actually has both endocrine and exocrine functions. Um, when we talk about the endocrine system, uh, we'll talk about uh, hormones that are produced by the pancreas, uh, mostly uh, uh, insulin and glucagon, which helps with uh, regulation of blood sugar levels. But the pancreas has uh, exocrine functions in that it produces enzymes um, that help break down uh, the macromolecules in our food, specifically the proteins in our food. So the main pancreatic duct and the common bile duct will then uh, secrete into this part of the small intestine known as the duodenum where uh, digestion will be completed and the smaller monomers of our foods will be uh, absorbed. So the small intestine will again complete digestion performs absorption. Uh, now all the parts are small enough uh, to be absorbed coming from our carbohydrates, our lipids, uh, and our proteins. So the small intestine is actually specialized for absorption. We can see these structures called microvilli in the lining of our small intestine. Uh, these are finger-like projections of the small intestinal lining um, that creates more surface area to absorb nutrients. We can see that the blood vessels where uh, absorption of our nutrients are very close to the surface of these microvilli um, to allow for absorption of our uh, monomers of our food. There's a condition known as celiac disease. Celiac disease is actually an autoimmune disease that will affect the digestive system, specifically uh, in the small intestine where absorption can take place. So if we have an, a problem with absorption, that means a patient with celiac disease cannot properly absorb the nutrients from, their, from our food. So we can actually see uh, the tissues of a normal a small intestine, which is microvilli with the, uh, the epithelial lining, to in celiac patients that disappearance of those microvilli. We have sort of a flattening out of the, the lining of our small intestine, uh, or of the uh, tissues lining the small intestine. So that decreases the amount of absorption that can take place. So celiac patients, they won't be able to absorb their nutrients. They often uh, have weight loss. Um, and, you know, usually this is corrected by uh, change in diet. And sometimes uh, we might have to resect part of the small intestine, depending on if there's any damage within the small intestine. So from the small intestine, food will now go to the large intestine. Our small intestine is actually 23 feet long, providing you know the most amount um, for absorption, whereas our large intestine is actually five feet long. But we can actually see the difference in the diameters between the small intestine and the large intestine. So the responsibility of the large intestine, also known as the colon, is to take in water that has not been absorbed. Um, so take in water uh, and get rid of the rest. So whatever hasn't been absorbed already, the majority of that will be absorbed within the large intestine. 
Uh, so the material left in the largest intestine is called feces. Feces is made up of undigested foods. Um, they're just foods that our body just cannot digest. Corn, for example, we do not have the enzymes that help us properly digest corn. So if we have a meal that includes corn, we can see pieces of corn in our feces if you ever you know, attempted to look at your own feces. Um, other material that is left um, that is undigestible includes epithelial cells. Um, we also know that, you know, uh, we have lots of water that still needs to be absorbed. Um, and within our large intestine, we have millions of bacteria. So the bacteria reside within our our large intestine and this bacteria actually help ferment and break down fibers and it's this bacteria that's actually responsible for the production of our flatus or gas that is why if someone is lactose intolerant and cannot break down uh, lactose bacteria love lactose and will actually you know uh, metabolize lactose and produce very um, smelly flatus or gas so that is one of the uh, symptoms of lactose intolerance but here we can see the structures within the large intestine we have that first part uh, of the ascending colon which is the cecum present in all humans and uh, coming from the small intestine going to the cecum and we can actually see this structure right here which is known as the appendix so the appendix is located on the right side the right lower quadrant um, attached to the cecum uh, there's no real um, added benefit to having an appendix aside from it possibly containing some uh, lymphatic uh, nodules which aid in our immunity, but for the most part, we don't need it to survive. And we also know what happens when it becomes inflamed or infected, causing an appendicitis, at which point uh, we need to take it out before it ruptures. And if it does rupture, it becomes perforated, which will leak out you know, um, all the materials from the large intestine to our abdomen, which could cause a lot of problems. But anywho, this is where the appendix is located, attached to the cecum. Uh, the cecum is the first part of that ascending colon, which will then go across the abdomen in the uh, transverse colon, from the transverse colon down to the descending colon, forming sort of an S shape, which is the sigmoid colon. And from the sigmoid colon, it will go down into the rectum. And then finally, feces will go out the GI uh, through the anal canal and out the anus. And again, we have more sphincters that um, allow for passage um, of the feces out uh, of the body. So there are actually some studies where um, you can donate your stool uh, for research. Um, here is a link to a New York Times article um, and then here is another article about why we should bank our own stool. So a lot of great research going on with regards to doing, you know, donating stool samples. And if you're interested, you can definitely read these articles and donate your stool and you know, uh, help with science and research. So that's it for the lecture portion of chapter 16. Uh, I did include a PowerPoint that kind of focused on the anatomy of the digestive system. Try not to get bogged down into too many details, but for the most part, um, that is the section in Chapter 16 on the digestive system.